Greetings, everybody. This is Paul Kovacs from the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in today for uh, our Friday Forum. We've got a really exciting session today. Uh, Clark Chapman's going to take us through some um, really important work that I think you'll enjoy. Just a little bit of um, uh, process and, and other materials I need to go through before uh, I introduce Clark and start the session. Uh, first, uh, I hope many of you will uh, join us uh, for next month's uh, Friday Forum. It's going to be on Friday, January 24. Michael Collage from uh, Natural Resources Canada is going to share some work on earthquakes. Uh, there is some new research and really important work saying that the risk of earthquakes in Canada is much higher than we previously thought, uh, particularly in the Victoria area, but this is national, right across the country. Um, and he's been sharing some of the work with the ICLR Insurance Advisory Committee, and he's going to give a more detailed presentation on January 24. Uh, so that's a really important session, and uh, I look forward to um, uh, many calling in for that one um, as you learn why we have a new understanding about earthquake risk in Canada and what it means for the insurance industry. Um, for today's session, uh, Clark will be presenting. Uh, when he's done, he'll uh, respond to your questions. Sophie Gilbo will, uh, of ICLR will uh, manage the uh, questions. There is on your screen a Q&A button. So if you have questions for Clark, please uh, enter them into the button. Sophie will collect those up and then share them on with uh, and Clark. Um, Clark will talk for 45, 60 minutes in this presentation, but then there'll be time, uh, perhaps half an hour, for, for he's agreed to respond to your questions. So if you have questions, use the Q&A uh, button and type them in, and Sophie will collect those up and pass them on. And if we run out of time, um, we'll, we'll uh, share the questions afterward and see if we can get them included then. But please use the uh, Q&A to ask your question. Okay, so I'm going to move to start today's session. Um, we are really honored to have Clark Chapman join us today. Uh, I was out last night looking at the full moon, and you can see the crater impacts on the moon. Um, asteroid strikes are not common, but they have had really significant impacts in the past and they are possible in the future. And uh, Clark is one of the world's leaders in terms of uh, studying and understanding and taking action to deal with these um, important risks. Uh, this is an issue that is typically not considered at a number of levels, but there are some governments uh, at the national level and definitely a lot of really important international efforts going on. Uh, Clark is usually central to many of those in terms of informing and sharing his expertise. Um, and, and we're really honored to have Clark here with us today. So for today's session, uh, he's gonna talk about near-Earth asteroid impacts, a rare but very interesting risk. Clark, over to you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, I'm Clark Chapman here in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm talking to you about the asteroid impact hazard, which is a unusual one. As Paul said, they're major impacts are very rare, but they have the potential for being much more catastrophic than any other known natural hazard. So we're talking about comets and asteroids. Actually, I'll concentrate on asteroids because comets, uh, while being very visible sometimes in the night sky, are much less frequent than uh, asteroids. And when an asteroid s strikes, it makes a hole in the ground, a crater. And uh, here is a map of all uh, identified craters uh, in the world and in the upper left uh, in Canada. Uh, I should say that the database for all known terrestrial impact craters is actually maintained in Canada at the U University of New Brunswick. Um, and that's uh, responsible for the distribution of white dots that are craters uh, on the map of the world. Now you might think uh, they're clustered in Australia and Canada and, and, and Europe and South Africa, but that's because uh, geology is uh, not very active in those areas. So a crater formed uh, billions of years ago may still remain in the record, unlike uh, more active geological areas. Of course, there's also some sparsity because of uh, uh, lack of population density or in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. It's hard to identify geology. But asteroids can strike anywhere in the world randomly. Canada isn't especially favored. Now, I want to just give a little nomenclature because my slides sometimes use these. 
near-Earth asteroids are NEAs, and they are asteroids that orbit the sun well inside the main asteroid belt. I'll show you where that is in the next slide. NEOs include comets, but as I said before, comets are a very small fraction of the danger. PHOs are uh, a term that a lot of uh, asteroid astronomers use for potentially hazardous objects, which are about 20% of the known uh, near-Earth asteroids. Uh, even most potentially hazardous asteroids, however, are extremely unlikely to hit. Now here's the sort of distribution of, of asteroids in the solar system. Uh, in the upper left, the uh, outermost circle there is the orbit of Jupiter. And you see the orbits of the planets in closer to the little yellow dot that's the sun. Um, the green uh, points that are all overlapping each other uh, in the diagram, not in space. If you're in the middle of the main asteroid belt where the green uh, donut is, you'd, you'd be hard pressed with your naked eye to see more than one or two other asteroids. It's, it's not like you see in some of the movies where Asteroids are all bumping into each other and it's very dangerous. The red dots are, are near-Earth asteroids in the inner solar system. At the bottom, it shows the distribution of asteroids uh, from left to right, from the Sun out to Jupiter, um, and the other axis shows their uh, orbital tilts. But uh, as you see, most asteroids are there in the middle of the main belt and the NEAs that we're going to be concentrating on uh, orbit, you know, around the Earth and, and Mars. Now here is a blow up of the central part of the inner solar system here and with the red dots being the uh, near Earth asteroids. And so we're in a cosmic shooting gallery. Now I'd like to start off here by looking at the smallest to biggest things that strike the Earth from interplanetary space. And uh, here's, here you can kind of go from upper left and circle around down to the lower left, going from the tiniest to the largest. And uh, you see pictures of things and then you see in the blue words are sort of the, how frequently they hit the Earth and the uh, green words indicate roughly how big they are. So we have meteor showers uh, on a clear night. You can go out where you live unless you're in the, I don't know, downtown Toronto or someplace. But if you can see, uh, see the stars, you can see every minute or two or so maybe uh, a, a meteor. They're harmless. They burn up way up in the upper atmosphere. Then on a weekly basis, uh, somewhere on the Earth, you get an impact by a, by a rock or a small boulder. Um, the picture of the car there is something that was hit by a meteorite, uh, meteorite that was witnessed over the eastern United States. My sister in North Carolina actually saw it. She was outside, but it struck this car. And this was a young woman's car, which uh, remarkably increased in value after being damaged. <laughs> Uh, she was able to sell it for a lot more than it was worth, uh, and it was taken around the world uh, along with meteorites. Um, the biggest uh, uh, disaster, which is not very big in comparison with the earthquakes and other things you, you folks are interested in, but it happened in 2013 in Chelyabinsk, um, Siberia, in Western Siberia, uh, at the top there's uh, a little picture of the uh, fireball in the sky. Uh, at the bottom, a little tiny chunk of this object um, crashed into a frozen lake, and you see the hole in the ice there. Continuing to the lower right, Tunguska is a very large um, multi-megaton blast that leveled a forest in uh, northeastern uh, Siberia in 1908 called Tunguska. It flattened this forest in an area about as big as what's encircled by the Beltway in Washington, D.C. Now, back in 1994, um, you know, it's, it's every half million years that something as big as a mountain strikes the Earth, but Jupiter is a much bigger target, and the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 struck Jupiter and made headlines around the world with a tiny backyard telescope. You could see the Earth-sized black spots in the atmosphere of Jupiter when, when that thing struck. And of course, you've probably heard of the uh, 
mass extinctor that uh, wiped out the dinosaurs and many of the species of life on Earth 66 million years ago. Uh, that's a something like a 10 kilometer wide asteroid that struck 66 million years ago, and those are very rare. So I'm now going to talk about the very biggest, just introduce you to the very biggest impacts, and then a couple of slides on the smallest. Mass extinctions, such as the end of the Cretaceous uh, impact, uh, are, occur maybe every 100 million years somewhere on the Earth by things larger than around 10 kilometer diameter asteroids. And compared to other natural disasters, impacts like this are by far the greatest destructive uh, energy per unit time delivered to the ecosphere. Um, you know, the effects of such an impact happen in hours and, and years, uh, whereas uh, other causes of mass extinctions, uh, I, you know, take hundreds to millions of years to, uh, to occur. The uh, little uh, picture on the lower left shows uh, a centimeter wide layer of rock, which represents the uh, uh, boundary layer of, uh, of stuff that uh, formed around the world uh, 66 million years ago when that impact happened. So in a, one of these very huge, extremely rare civilization threatening impacts, uh, there's total destruction in the near crater zone that may be tens of kilometers across. Uh, if it hits in the ocean, uh, it causes a tsunami. Um, there's widespread fires that uh, happen around the world as the material ejected from this huge crater um, uh, go into space and f fly back down as, as meteors, just you know, billions and trillions of them and broil what's on the surface of the earth. Uh, over a period of weeks and months, there's stratospheric dust that obscures the sun and threatens agriculture. Uh, poisoning of the biosphere can happen. Of course, earthquakes are caused by such an impact, but they tend to be modest compared to the uh, other, other effects. Uh, electric magnetic pulse is a potential major problem, but it's not been well studied. Now to go to the other end of the scale of, of relevant impacts, not counting uh, meteor showers, we have this event from 2013 um, when this uh, 20 meter wide body exploded over Chelyabinsk in Siberia. Chelyabinsk is not a small town. It has a population of about a million people. There were many videos from dash cams. Uh, they were very common back then uh, in, in Russia for various sociological region, re reasons. And so there's lots of pictures of this brilliant uh, six times brighter than the sun uh, fireball. Uh, about 1,400 people showed up at hospitals with injuries and mainly what happened was that a shock wave uh, struck uh, while they were all looking out the windows. They've seen a brilliant flash of light, you know, six times brighter than the sun. So people went over to the windows to look and see what it was and, uh, you know, 30 seconds or a minute later, the shockwave hits, breaks the windows, and a lot of people got, got hurt. And there was some structural damage in, Ch in Chelyabinsk as well. Um, this was basically uh, a half megaton air, air burst. So it was very sizable, you know, enormously larger than the atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And this was the biggest asteroid impact on Earth since the 30 June 1908 Tunguska event. Uh, effects of these smallest, uh, most likely impacts. The uh, damage and casualties are, are at most like a minor natural disaster, a tornado or a modest wildfire. I'll get into comparisons with other natural disasters later. Of course, there's a public and national overreaction um, that happened after 9-11, you know, might be predicted. The stock market, homeland security hysteria, the Iraq war and so on all could be uh, uh, ascribed to uh, a panic uh, after 9-11. But I, I should point out that this did not happen uh, in Chelyabinsk in, 19, in 2013. 
Uh, an otherwise harmless but brilliant fireball could be mistaken for an atomic attack causing a dangerous response, uh, especially in some place like uh, Korea or, or the Mideast. Um, that was a great worry back when nobody really knew much about asteroids uh, impacting the Earth uh, back in the 1980s, say, but it didn't happen in Chelyabinsk that there was this kind of reaction, despite the fact that Chelyabinsk is, has one of the major centers of nuclear arms development in, in Russia. Uh, very rare events are very poorly understood. Only half of Russians polled believe that Chelyabinsk was caused by a meteor. Uh, some of the other crazy ideas uh, are in the lower left part of this slide. Uh, um, it's uh, very, very difficult for people to understand what happens when they aren't regular events that happen during a human lifetime. Now, the impacts of practical concern in this table, I'm not going to go through this table at great length, but uh, this goes from asteroids with diameters of three meters, you know, the size of a small car, to uh, diameters of three kilometers. And so the impact energy ranges from two kilotons to one and a half million megatons. And, uh, you know, they, the kinds of uh, damage or character of the events are listed on the, on the right. And I'm trying to emphasize that there's a whole spectrum of uh, sizes of events. That's not true for most kinds of, uh, of disasters. I want to t tell you a little bit about the history of recognizing this hazard. Uh, b back in 1931, that's when this uh, um, news article uh, appeared in, in a London newspaper. At that time, only four near-Earth asteroids had been discovered. And so there was almost no thinking about the impact threat, but there was this report from Brazil of meteors coming down in the jungle and burning down vast regions. Uh, this was never really confirmed, so it's not sure that it happened, but such an event could have happened like the Tunguska event in 1908. And of course, the treatment in this British newspaper was sensational as many newspaper accounts continue to be dealing with asteroids, you know, menace, huge bombs, hurricane of flame, blazing bolts. Actually, the idea that things from outer space could be dangerous uh, had a even more ancient history when almost nothing was known. There's a cartoon in the lower left of a comet uh, breaking the earth apart. This is not possible. <laughs> this won't ever happen. Um, moving along in the history, in 1989 um, was the first time in the near passage of a near-Earth asteroid, twice as far away as the moon, made the front page of the New York Times in the upper left. Um, it was called a near miss, and believe it or not, um, near miss day was created. And you can Google near miss day, and there are dozens, if not hundreds, of entries about near miss day, which is, I don't know, April something or March 20th, well, whatever, whatever that date was in, in 1989. It really wasn't very dangerous. It's just that we were starting to look in the skies for asteroids by that time. Now, there's been a lot of coverage of uh, potential disasters from asteroids, and they're mostly, mostly wrong. Here's the front cover of Newsweek magazine back in 1992, when Brian Marsden, who was then the director of the Minor Planet Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, did a faulty back-of-the-envelope calculation while talking with a science reporter from the Boston Globe, David Chandler, and said that this comet had a distinct chance of uh, hitting the Earth. Turns out he completely screwed up in his calculations and uh, the chances were totally remote that uh, this comet would hit. Um, Again, uh, same Brian Marsden in 1997. Uh, he was a friend of mine. He was a, a, a good astronomer and he's, he's passed away now, but uh, he again screwed up in predicting that on 26 October, 2028, this uh, kilometer sized asteroid was had a 
chance be, uh, greater than one in a thousand of striking the earth. Had he instead not used the envelope, but used a calculator or a small computer, he would have found out that the chances of this asteroid hitting were 10 to the minus 42 power, uh, or zero effectively. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you see the headlines in the newspapers and Time Magazine and so on that, uh, anyway, th this um, XF-11 affair, that XF-11 is part of the designation of the asteroid, um, really inspired NASA and the U.S. Congress and so on to take the issue more seriously, as we'll see. Now, th around the same time, kind of by accident, these two asteroid disaster movies came out, near, uh, Deep Impact and Armageddon. Armageddon was completely dreadful in terms of uh, uh, trying to relate it to anything scientific. Deep Impact was better, although imperfect. Um, but Armageddon was nominated for four Oscars, including Best Visual Effects, despite the fact that uh, these visual effects were completely unreal. But uh, a lot of people saw these movies and uh, the percentage of people who were knowledgeable that there was a potential danger from asteroids increased from 25%, which was determined to be the case uh, by a poll by Paul Slovic in Oregon back in 1994. At, uh, most people now are aware in some fashion that asteroids can cause disasters. Now, an important event happened in 2008 when this telescope in the upper left corner uh, in the mountains near Tucson, Arizona, discovered this asteroid. They quickly calculated that it was going to strike Earth just 20 hours later. And uh, communications by, the, by, by then were pretty good. And a bunch of other astronomers at other observatories got measurements of the light curves. As the asteroid rotated, it gets brighter and fainter and brighter and fainter. And they were able to measure its spectrum. And then it hit uh, very close to where it was predicted in the deserts of Sudan um, 20 hours after it was discovered. And you see there in the left-hand side, uh, sort of the atmospheric train uh, left over Sudan. And then meteorite collectors uh, uh, swarmed uh, over the, the locale and found many, many, uh, 700 pieces of this uh, broken up uh, small asteroid in the, in the desert, a picture there at the lower left. And this was the first recognition that we can detect a very small near Earth object just days to weeks in this, this case, hours before impact, so that warnings are possible. Prior to this time, everybody interested in these impact disasters were thinking of uh, discovering them years before they hit and launching spacecraft missions to deflect them. And that's all, uh, all possibly relevant, because of course, big asteroids discovered decades in advance are probably big enough to do horrible, horrible damage. But if you're concerned about something like the Chelyabinsk thing or even something smaller uh, landing on your house, uh, getting a warning in advance uh, by a few days or so on can be very helpful. You can uh, evacuate. So there's the, these evolving perceptions uh, about the scientific perceptions, I guess I'd say, about the, ha about the neo hazard. Um, it, it really all started scientifically around 1981 when there was actually a conference in Snowmass, Colorado, NASA-sponsored conference of a number of, quite a few dozen uh, scientists. And this was just a year after the publication in Science Magazine of the hypothesis by, uh, by uh, the Alvarez father and son team and their collaborators about the theory that uh, the uh, end Cretaceous mass extinction 66 million years ago was due to an asteroid impact. And so uh, scientists started hunting for that crater. In fact, it was Alan Hildebrand, uh, a Canadian scientist who uh, uh, basically uh, discovered the, the remnants of the crater in the Yucatan part of Mexico that uh, it was, resulted from the impact 66 million years ago. By the early 1990s, we were mainly worried about impacts by asteroids, you know, two kilometers across and larger. 
because they could destroy civilization as we know it. And that at that time, you could calculate that the chances that your tombstone will say that you died by a neo-impact is similar to death by an airliner crash. Now, uh, it's a very different qualitative situation because if you died by a neo-impact, that's because you know, hundreds of millions of people will, or billions will have died by an extremely unlikely large impact. Whereas of course, deaths by air airliner crashes happen uh, almost every, every year. But uh, statistically, the per year number killed is roughly the same, at least as we knew it in 1994. Things have improved, as you'll see. At that time, of course, most the most likely knowledge of a neo impact is when it when it strikes, because we weren't looking out for them hardly at all. Now, 16 years ago, in 2003, NASA published a, a very long, detailed report about uh, asteroid impacts, and uh, most of the greater than one kil kilometer neos that have been discovered by that time were found. Well, most of them had been discovered, and all, none of those that had been discovered had orbits that had any chance of hitting the Earth in the next century. So that starts reducing the actual hazard during our lifetimes, is if you know that some fraction, and hopefully a large fraction of the uh, near Earth asteroids have their orbits calculated and we know they won't hit, well, that reduces the chance from if you aren't looking. Um, Tunguskas happen every 4,000 years, kind of uh, unusual that one happened just within uh, the last century or so. Uh, at the time, 16 years ago, it was thought that uh, asteroids smaller than about 50 meters in diameter wouldn't be dangerous. I have a colleague who said that something 30 meters across were predicted to hit, he'd run, run toward it to watch the impact. But then Chelyabinsk happened <laughs> by, by something only 20 meters in diameter and uh, caused a lot of damage. And uh, we're realizing that impacts by smaller asteroids, which happen more often, of course, than large ones, uh, can be pretty serious. Um, a few years ago, uh, as I showed the, this asteroid TC3 uh, that hit in the Sudan uh, demonstrated that small telescopes that have the potential, if we set them all up, and they're starting to be set up now, might find as many as 50% of tiny near-Earth asteroids days, days or weeks before they hit. Now, another 50% will come from the direction of the sun, and we have no hope of finding them. The danger from greater than one kilometer near Earth asteroids is now down by a factor of 10 from what we were thinking about in 1994. But we are also realizing, as I think I said, that the damage by the more frequent tiny and uh, near Earth asteroids are, are, are more, more serious than we imagined uh, in earlier years. So let's compare the NEA impact uh, hazard with other dangers and natural hazards. This pie chart in lower left here shows that, you know, most people die by war and epidemics and famine and sizable but still modest percentages by natural hazards that we're aware of, <coughs> that we're aware of, but um, we do get worried by things that kill not very many people like uh, terrorism and the neo uh, impact hazard is, is one of those, uh, uh, similar to volcanoes. Of course, we've just heard of volcanoes killing a dozen people in New Zealand in the last week or so. Now, this is a chart um, that me and my colleague David Morrison from NASA Ames Research Center published in 1994 in Nature magazine. And the chances of most of these causes of death are roughly the same today as, as they were then. But the asteroid impact hazard, um, this uh, red arrow here is the range of the lower limit and upper limit of danger that we discuss, discussed in our 1994 paper. There was great uncertainties at the time, but um, because of the Space Guard survey uh, since 1998, discovering so many near-Earth asteroids and, 
and subsequent research showing that none of them can hit in the next century, the, the risk has decreased to uh, this, this kind of range by, by this year. I'll do more of this uh, later on, but this just shows roughly the sizes of asteroids and causes of uh, potential human casualties uh, worldwide. Um, these are aerial bursts over land by 100 meters kind of asteroids. Tsunamis uh, are the dominant effect at these sizes and global effects are due to asteroids a couple of kilometers across and larger that uh, contribute the greatest to, uh, to the statistical death st statistics. But as time goes on, we're reducing the chances uh, by, particularly for the largest ones, as we're discovering almost all of them by now. Um, but I'll get, I'll get to this uh, a little later. Now this is a very schematic chart, but it sort of shows the qualitative difference between other kinds of accidents that some of you folk are, uh, deal with, um, which in which the number of deaths per event are shown along here. You know, here are auto accidents, which typically kill, you know, just a few people, although it involves a bus, you know, dozens of people presumably can be killed. but. You just don't have automobile accidents killing 10,000 people or 100,000 people at a time. But, um, you know, hurricanes and earthquakes uh, can do that and floods, but there really aren't any floods or earthquakes or hurricanes in recent, uh, in recorded history that, you know, killed more than 10 million people in an event. But asteroids um, are totally of the opposite sort, where um, the most deaths per year, similar to floods and earthquakes and so on, at least as we knew it in 1994, uh, came typically from things that killed a billion people um, and, and not the kind of asteroid impact that kills only a few people. Uh, because of the surveys, we now have reduced the uh, number of uh, the, the chance, the, the death rate um, from large asteroids. Now, I'd like to just compare real disasters <laughs> that happen with uh, potential asteroid disasters. There was an international meeting in Italy in 2015 where there was a tabletop exercise, a completely imaginary asteroid impact uh, possibility that was analyzed. And this is the risk corridor, these red dots. It turns out that we can define very well a path across the Earth where a dangerous asteroid might hit. Uh, we are sure that an, an asteroid won't deviate in this direction from the path, but we don't know where along the path it will hit. And the effort, of course, is to observe it ever more carefully and narrow the, uh, uh, the place down to the actual ground zero, which in this case wound up being Dhaka, Bangladesh. But just two weeks after this uh, tabletop exercise, there was an actual earthquake in Nepal that killed many thousands of people. So that's the real disaster compared to the hypothetical asteroid impact disaster. Um, this chart kind of compares neo-impacts with climate change. There's some similarities, they're global in scale, and, and we can at least potentially do something about it if we can't politically, at least uh, technologically possible to do something about it. There's dissimilarities though, because the neo-impacts, oop, uh, global impacts have effects within hours in the case of neo-impacts, whereas if Time scale for climate change are decades to a century or more. Uh, and of course, neo impacts are, are large ones are extremely unlikely to happen this century, whereas climate change is happening right now. Most effects of a modest neo impact are familiar from other natural hazards. There's strong winds and shock waves, falling rocks and landslides, seismic shaking, brilliant light and heat, maybe fire. 
So in some sense, uh, asteroid impacts resemble in some ways uh, an earthquake, a wildfire, landslide, volcanic eruption, or windstorm. Of course, in the case of the asteroid impact, these effects are nearly simultaneous and act synergistically. And it's a little hard to predict really what the, what uh, the, the final results actually are, but it's uh, advanced planning and emergency response measures should generally apply to asteroids. They aren't totally mysterious and weird. Uh, they're not radioactive. They don't, they aren't accompanied by space aliens or anything like that. So most effects, as I said, of the impact hazard are familiar. Um, there is the issue of warning versus no warning. Uh, most natural disasters have little or no warning, whereas the chances of advance warning for asteroids um, can be very long, decades uh, for the large ones, and uh, maybe weeks uh, or more for relatively small ones. Um, of course, impact disasters um, are, can happen anywhere uh, on the Earth, and if they're large, they can affect the entire Earth. And uh, that's unlike disaster planning for, for most natural disasters, which are much more likely to happen in earthquake zones or on shorelines than they are elsewhere. And you can, uh, pr can undertake sort of local uh, mitigation measures. Okay, I'd like to talk about how we would deal with the asteroid impact hazard. How many uh, asteroids and comets there are of various sizes are, are, are well known. Uh, how much energy is delivered by an asteroid of a particular size is also very well known from just by physics. How much dust is raised in the stratosphere and the other environmental consequences are somewhat known. Uh, the response of the biosphere is rather poorly known, agriculture, forests, ocean life, um, and the response of human psychology, sociology, political systems, and economies to such a catastrophe is very poorly known. Um, the response to 9-11, for example, is, uh, I don't think anyone would have predicted all the major consequences from, from killing 3,000 people that actually happened. So, so the way we address this hazard is first to find a threatening asteroid. So searching the skies for asteroids with telescopes and so on is step number one, because if we don't find that one's coming, we can't do anything about it. We can then evaluate the threat, identify this risk corridor, this line across the earth that can be calculated really very early on. Um, and uh, try to narrow, narrow that down, and we can evaluate the likely environmental and human consequences from knowing how big the asteroid is and where it's likely to hit. And then mitigation of the threat. There are various ways of mitigating the threat. Um, I'll get into that a little more. Uh, civil defense measures are the obvious thing to consider for short warning times and small asteroids, evacuation. Um, for a larger asteroid with long years, at least, of warning time, we could deflect it with a spacecraft, and I'll get into that uh, a little later. Um, or we could destroy it. Um, this is uh, kind of controversial, but a lot of people who build bombs, you know, if they have a hammer or what is it? If you have, if you have a hammer, then uh, everything looks like a nail. And uh, so there's a lot of discussion of uh, nuclear blasting an asteroid. It's really not necessary except in some rare circumstances, extremely rare. Now the Space Guard survey has been the main, um, the main uh, approach to looking in the skies, trying to find an asteroid uh, with our name on it. Uh, this was begun in 1998 when NASA promised Congress, U.S. Congress, that it would find 90% of NEAs greater than a kilometer diameter in the following 10 years. It's actually taken more like 20 years to do that, but that's, that's now been accomplished um, by the, uh, chiefly by the observatories shown in the upper right uh, in New Mexico, Arizona, and in Maui. Um, there, uh, there has been some help from uh, 
other observatories in other countries and by amateur astronomers and following up on the initial discoveries to calculate the orbits of these asteroids. In the lower right hand corner you see uh, the, the little red uh, slice of that of those curves is for those larger than uh, one kilometer diameter and that's the 95 percent or so of uh, of large asteroids are, have now been found. And you see uh, that we now have about 21,000 near-Earth asteroids that have been cataloged. We know their orbits. Um, that's a whole lot more than the four that were known in 1931. Now this gets into the uh, annual deaths. And these, this is from a report published a couple years ago that uh, I have a, a link to uh, at the end of the talk, um, showing the casualties. In, in the lower left, these this is sort of a, each, uh, each increment in size, uh, this graph shows that, you know, many hundreds of deaths, casualties really means deaths in these charts, I believe, although later on in, the, in this report, there is some consideration of the additional damage from injuries I don't think that casualties here includes injuries. I think these are deaths. And so uh, hundreds on a statistical average are killed by these extremely rare asteroids larger than a kilometer diameter. Um, a cumulative curve is shown in the lower right. And you can see in the upper, upper right, the cumulative curve has various components of deaths from uh, a global disaster by a large asteroid those from the smaller local uh, uh, impacts, and also tsunami. And as you see, tsunamis are really way down and very, very unlikely to uh, be causes of death. Now, there are benefits for searching and retiring many NEOs larger than 140 meter diameter is the current, current goal. And these curves are the same as on the previous slide except showing chiefly reductions in the, uh, in the casualties expected from large asteroids because those are the ones that we most readily see. Now this report is based on, uh, on uh, searches by large, large telescopes for asteroids that might be discovered years or decades in advance and does not take into account uh, new searches that are now possible for uh, finding imminent impactors, which I think my next slide will discuss. Yeah, um, ATLAS is uh, partially operational. I, I think they plan to have six telescopes around the world, but at the moment there are two on two different uh, mountaintops in Hawaii uh, that they find with days to weeks warning these uh, town killers to county killers as they uh, call them here. Um, with six around the world, we might find a large fraction of these tiny asteroids um, and, and with time to warn people to evacuate. There's a similar project in, uh, by the European Space Agency called FlyEye uh, that's under development, will be located in Sicily, that is expected to provide three weeks warning for a large fraction of near-Earth asteroids larger than 40 meters in diameter. Now, for larger asteroids, we've got uh, surveys that are being under planning or development. The um, uh, LSSP, Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is under construction in Chile. It's eight meters, it's mirrors, eight meters across, a really giant optical telescope. And its primary science goals are cosmology, but it has an official secondary goal of uh, doing a near-Earth object survey. And it's uh, under construction, and I think it's mostly constructed by now, and I'm not quite sure when it first uh, makes its first observation, but it could be quite soon. NEOCAM is uh, not so far along, but it's received some funding from NASA. It's uh, a spacecraft that would be launched into a place uh, on the sunward side of the Earth. Uh, it would be built by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and uh, do a major infrared 
search for asteroids. Asteroids are easier to see in the infrared than in, well, they can be seen in the optical, but there's an awful lot of bright stars. Um, uh, asteroids being warmed by the sunlight, particularly near-Earth asteroids that are closer to the sun, are much, much brighter than stars in the infrared. So what are the effects of a NEO impact? Um, well, there's lots of things to study. Um, you, you can go to this website shown here, uh, which is an interactive program where if you enter the parameters of size and so on of, of, the, of the asteroid, the impact parameters, uh, how fast it's coming and what angle will it hit at, and you input the, uh, the properties of the, of the target material, ground zero, you know, whether it's water or different kinds of rocks, this uh, interactive online uh, tool will tell you how big the crater is and how far away you'll get burned and various other such effects. There's lots of kinds of uh, effects being researched. Uh, how does a near-Earth asteroid interact with the atmosphere? What does it do to the chemistry like ozone? Uh, how bright does it get and how far away will fires be set? At what altitude would it explode? How powerful are the shock waves? If it strikes the ocean, how big and dangerous is the tsunami? If it strikes the land, how far away does, uh, do ejected rocks fly? Um, what magnitude earthquake results? How serious are all of these effects synergistically combined? Uh, how much sunlight is blocked? How serious are climate changes that might last months or years? Um, what are the effects on agriculture and so on? Uh, how will humans be affected? Uh, I'm not sure a whole lot of research is being done on this, but this could be really important. Um, how will warnings be communicated? And will they be understood and obeyed for a very, very rare kind of, uh, of disaster? We don't have, uh, we don't have um, exercises of hiding in closets and so on to protect ourselves from a terrorist or from a nuclear war because uh, it's very unlikely to happen. Anyway, mitigation. Now, you probably know a lot about mitigation. That's what you think about when you're trying to uh, decrease the casualties from various kinds of natural disasters. But in the asteroid business, um, the typical asteroid engineer or scientist uh, thinks of deflection as being mitigation. And I guess it is a kind of deflection, so the asteroid doesn't hit <laughs> instead of hits, it is uh, definitely reduce, reducing the hazard to zero if it doesn't hit. Um, but uh, uh, what's not well understood by my colleagues is that because there are, it's much, much more likely that we'll have a Chelyabinsk kind of event uh, than uh, being struck by a 400 meter diameter asteroid, um, it's uh, civil defense that's uh, uh, really what we're going to be dealing with almost all, always. This is a um, color coded uh, graph of the ways to mitigate the effects of a near Earth asteroid impact uh, from a 20 large, important 2010 report by the National Research Council of the U.S. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, and, and uh, you know, for big asteroids uh, near the top, you know, me, uh, kilometer across, uh, you're getting into the realm where, I mean, the most favored way is to deflect it with a kinetic impact. That is, crash a crash a spacecraft into the asteroid, and it'll bump it a little bit. If you do this. Years in advance, uh, the asteroid trajectory will continue to diverge from where it was he originally headed and it'll miss the Earth rather than hitting it. Um, uh, but if, you, if it gets up to, uh, up to being uh, kilometer sized or larger, you'd need several of these spacecraft mass masses to deflect it. And maybe the only thing that's powerful enough is a nuclear blast. But of course, these are extremely unlikely to be, to happen and be necessary. Uh, let me talk in the, about gravity tractor and civil defense uh, later here in this slide. Gravity tractor is a concept a colleague of mine developed uh, back uh, about 15 years ago, 
where just the gravity of a large spacecraft can tug on an asteroid uh, a little bit. And if it stays around and hovers in, near the asteroid, it can gradually move the asteroid onto a slightly different orbit, causing it to miss the Earth. But this really only works for a pretty small asteroid, uh, tens to maybe 100 meters in, in size. Uh, here up here is a standoff nuclear blast uh, that might be necessary for a very huge asteroid or for a smaller one with very short warning time, but that's, that's really dangerous and highly controversial. A uh, kinetic impactor is what we think is the most likely way of diverting a, a plausible, although still extremely rare, asteroid. Now there's a mission called DART that's uh, been approved by, by NASA and uh, is going to impact the, there's a double asteroid called Didymos and it has a little moon going around it. It itself is not very big, it's a near-Earth asteroid, but the spacecraft will crash into Didymos and there's a just approved European mission called Hera that um, uh, is going to go out a few years later. Originally it was hoped it would be there to watch the impact, but it'll go out a few years later and see what kind of damage was done to the to the moon and how the moon's orbit has changed. And we also can just look at that little moon with Earth-based telescopes and measure the amount of momentum delivered to this little moon uh, as a simulating an, an asteroid that we want to divert and uh, measure this quantity beta, which is the additional momentum that's achieved by all the debris flying back from a crater made by the impact. Now, mitigation by civil defense is really going to be uh, important if there's going to be any uh, warnings in the next decades. Um, understanding the effects actually has evolved over the last few decades, so mitigation approaches must also evolve. The globally catastrophic effects have been reduced by at least a factor of 10 so the possibility that we'll need nukes to deflect or destroy a multi-kilometer NEO is almost vanishingly small. Tunguska-like events are, are more likely than we thought to cause regional catastrophes. So we need to find asteroids uh, tens of meters uh, across um, to provide the possibility for emergency response and recovery. And Chelyabinsk also shows that very small frequent NEOs may have dangerous effects. We used to think that something the size of 20 meters would cause no damage at all, but uh, in Chelyabinsk, uh, they did. Lucky nobody died. 1,400 went to the hospital. Mitigation uh, really means switching from space mission deflection to civil defense. 99.9% uh, .9 of NEO mitigation will have nothing to do with deflecting or destroying the asteroid, but instead will involve disaster management, civil defense, risk management, emergency preparedness, risk communication, and so on. There's vital needs to reduce the uncertainties quickly. One thing is that in this upper left uh, diagram, there's there's a dark large circle and a small white circle. They're both equally bright as seen as a star-like asteroid in, in the night sky, but we don't know which, which it is. So it's from just measuring how bright an asteroid is, you could have its size uncertain by a factor of three and its destructive energy uncertain by a factor of 30. So you must measure these potentially dangerous asteroids more carefully to find out really how big are they. And uh, of course, human procrastination is a common attribute of our psychology. And uh, if the chances of impact are one in a thousand, is anyone gonna do anything about that? I mean, if the probability is one in three, I think uh, any, <laughs> anyone will view that as a serious threat. But so there's an urgent need for astrometry. And astrometry is basically the a, a, a astronomical technique of measuring the position of the asteroid to determine its orbit ev and trajectory ever more accurately to determine if it will hit or not and whether you need to mount a deflection mission or not. And the sooner you can determine that, and, uh, 
determine that the probability is actually high and you got to do something or that it's really very, very low or zero and not worth, worth it. Uh, doing that soon is important. The risk corridor, corridor uh, this path across the Earth where an asteroid might hit, uh, it's really important to determine that as fast as possible because with unless it's done fast, people may start selling their properties if they're along the risk corridor or, you know, it, it can be psychologically very distressing if you're li living in, well, in Dhaka, uh, Bangladesh, for example, uh, if that event were to occur. Now, we need to know about the projectile as well, um, at the asteroid itself. And asteroids are very diverse. Some are double, there's even triple asteroids. Some have very different shapes. Some are made of ices, some are made of metal, some are made of rocks. Uh, so we need to learn about them, and we are. Just this year, uh, just last month, uh, NASA's, uh, I mean, Japan's Hayabusa, Hayabusa 2 mission to this asteroid, these are two different sides of Ryugu, um, uh, they've uh, collected uh, samples. Um, here, here's a, two frames of a movie, the upper one showing a close-up of the asteroid surface with the spacecraft going down to collect a sample, and it shoots a little bullet and rock spray up, and uh, the spacecraft captures some of this, and it did, and it actually left Ryugu just last month, and uh, it's going to, will return to the Earth uh, late next year, bringing the sample back for, for scientific analysis and laboratories. NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission to the asteroid Bennu is ongoing right now. In fact, uh, they have just selected, it's covered with rocks, and this is a problem for a spacecraft collecting a sample. Um, you, know, you don't want to have the spacecraft try to touch down and land on the side of a boulder, but just uh, within the last few days, I think it's been announced that they have decided on the safest place here to try to collect a sample, and it will bring back a sample in 2023 to Utah um, if all, all goes well. Just a couple more slides here on public perception. Um, you know, a major impact disaster has never been experienced in recorded history, and the Tiny chances combined with the huge potential consequences are very difficult for people to comprehend. Um, the impact hazard is dreadful and apocalyptic, and hence people are, tend to overreact to, to disasters that have that, uh, those, those uh, attributes, uh, according to research by Paul Slovic and, and others. And of course, unfortunately, scientific and mathematical literacy kind of prevails, at least in the United States. I think. Maybe it's better in Canada, uh, but people don't understand these things very well. Um, on an impact course with Earth, there was this uh, occasion back in 2002 when the BBC uh, reporter David Whitehouse uh, used this on collision course in this headline for which then became a headline around the world when in fact its actual calculated chances of hitting the earth were less than one in a hundred thousand and uh morrison and i criticized this uh, reporter and he came back and said it was pedantry for us to say that the probability of such an impact was so low that it's misleading to use the words collision course white house won a journalism award that year for this article um he's since become a uh, spokesman for a British uh, climate change denying group. There's a scale that we try to use to communicate the risk to the earth. Uh, events having no likely consequences, certain collisions, and so on, and it's basically a function of how big is the uh, potential, uh, is the energy of the potential impact, and What's the probability? Is it extremely tiny or, or very large? And um, unfortunately, color codes of dangers like this have not been very effective and have, they became a joke when the US Homeland Security Department tried to use such a color code for terrorism. Uh, but anyway, we try. So here's my final slide. Um, the hazard is real. It compels us to contemplate the most extreme possible environmental disaster 
and put the lesser, more likely ones into context. Um, it helps distinguish uh, between societal threats like terrorism and true regional or global natural catastrophes. Many threats to society and our lives are here today, like uh, Ebola, war, famine, global warming. But asteroids are in our future as flashes in the sky, as places to travel to eventually, as fuel stations for a spare spacefaring nation. But in the very unlikely event that a big one threatens us, this is one kind of natural disaster that we can prevent. Can't prevent a hurricane, you can evacuate, uh, you can't prevent an earthquake, you can strengthen uh, housing and so on, but we actually can uh, deflect an asteroid using currently available and known techniques of spacecraft. Um, that's the end and I'm uh, available to answer any questions that are sent to me. Thank you very much, Clark. This was, uh, this was a really interesting presentation and it generated a lot of questions online. So um, if, if anyone else has questions that they would like to ask at this time, please uh, do write them up in the question box and I will make sure to include them. So, <coughs> sorry, first question. Uh, you mentioned a few times the Tunguska event. Uh, has it determined whether it was a meteorite or a comet that hit the ground for that event? It's not been determined for sure, but um, as we run computer models and, and uh, study things like the Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact in Jupiter and study terrestrial impact craters, uh, the consensus is that it was basically a rocky object, an asteroid and, and, and not a comet that exploded, uh, I don't know, 10 kilometers up. It was kind of like the Chelyabinsk thing, except bigger and more powerful and exploded lower down, but in the atmosphere. Uh, but I'd say that there are probably a few people who still have other ideas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, how do we estimate the number of large asteroids that have not been observed? Uh, or what's the uncertainty about um, the asteroids that haven't been observed? Right, well, um, uh, basically, it's we have these surveys going on um, where you know we see these uh, tracks of uh, of uh, objects in in our CCD cameras uh, that aren't known stars, and so they're asteroids. And by uh, it's gotten to the point where almost every time an asteroid is uh, is, is seen and and measured, it turns out to be a known one. You know, back. 20 years ago, almost every asteroid that was found, you know, was a new one. It wasn't in the catalogs yet, but um, we're approaching the point where almost all of them are known, and, and you can, you know, project how many more from these rediscovery statistics, how many more are likely to be there. And we've, for things larger than a kilometer, we've discovered uh, oh, 900 and 50 or I, I don't know exactly what the number is, but something like that. And there's only a few few dozen at most that remain to be discovered uh, from that kind of reasoning. Okay, thank you. I, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that uh, we are getting better at, at predicting and observing uh, asteroids. Uh, you did also mention that uh, we struggle a bit more with the ones that are coming from the sun. Um, do you think we are likely to be able to predict them uh, or, or observe them more so in the future? Is there research in that field being done at the moment? Well, the difficulty with asteroids coming from the sun, I think, is, is pretty clear for, for those that you're trying to provide a warning uh, of days or hours, days, weeks, months, because, you know, the sun is in a certain part of the sky and, and the sky is blue and you don't see very many stars with your eye or with telescopes uh, uh, in, in, a, in the blue sky. So um, it's really difficult to, so the only way you're going to find those uh, that are coming from that direction is to find them, I don't know, a year earlier or years earlier when they're not coming from that direction and it's only as 
the Earth goes around the Sun and they go around the Sun that, that winds up that their orbit orbital trajectory has them coming toward the Earth from the Sun. So there's always going to be a, a fraction, I think, of small asteroids that we just won't know, know about until they hit or generally miss. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, I have a two-part question. So uh, first, when a large asteroid is observed, how is the risk of impact determined? And second part, can you also tell us about uh, B612 and their efforts to protect the Earth? Okay, I'll start on the first one. Um, when one of these large search telescopes discovers an asteroid and reports it to the Minor Planet Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, lots of other astronomers and amateur astronomers are uh, you know, look at that website and see asteroids that they might go out and try to follow up on. And you need to follow up on, on these asteroids to measure their positions to calculate an, an accurate orbit. And, um, you know, sometimes there isn't any follow up and we really don't know where the asteroid will be, you know, year, years from now. But, uh, but a lot of them are getting followed up through all of this uh, subsequent work and that refines the orbit and the trajectory and we can project it more, more and more accurately uh, the more measurements and observations are made. Now, of course, if the asteroid is small or far away, uh, it may be too faint to follow up on. And so it, it, it depends on the asteroid as to how, how soon we can determine its, its trajectory and ultimately where it might hit or how close it might come to the Earth. Um, that's that's the process, and uh, it's done a really good job on the, on the large asteroids. Um, and we're trying to with the LSST telescope and NeoCam to um, you know to find more asteroids and follow up on more asteroids so that we know where where more of them are going to be precisely going. Um, as for B612, um, I'm one of the founders of this foundation uh, back in 2002 with uh, Rusty Schweikert, uh, the Apollo 9 astronaut, and, and Ed Liu, who's uh, another American astronaut, and, and Pete Hutt, who's an astrophysicist uh, at Princeton University. Anyway, the original idea was to um, educate uh, people about about this and Lusty in particular is in countless uh, uh, science documentaries and so on. I think we did a pretty good job. We then um, designed um, a spacecraft to be launched that would hunt for asteroids, it would be sent into orbit near the orbit of Venus, look back out towards the Earth and uh, catalog a lot, of, a lot of asteroids. We hooked up with Ball Aerospace Corporation to design the spacecraft and the and the mission. Um, the aim was to get really rich people to to fund this, not to do it through the government, um, but to uh, have rich people do it. And we had a a number of rich people contribute, and they're continuing to contribute, but not at the levels that will fund a spacecraft. So a somewhat similar spacecraft uh, has been designed at Jet Propulsion Laboratory called NeoCam, which I briefly described. And it has a, a lot better chance of, uh, of happening than, than our, our, our spacecraft Sentinel. So we're now continuing um, with the uh, Asteroid Institute. We uh, support a number of graduate students in, in astronomy who work on calculating orbits of asteroids and probabilities of impacts. And uh, we're involved with uh, um, launching some, some uh, shoebox sized uh, satellites that can detect some asteroids and taking various other approaches to uh, try, trying to uh, solve elements of this problem that other people aren't working on. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, there, there's a lot that has been done by the United States and, and NOAA to uh, protect the Earth from asteroids. 
would, would you be able to share uh, which other countries have been uh, activate, ac actively involved in managing the risk of asteroid impact? Yeah, there are, every two years, there's a planetary defense conference held at which hundreds of scientists and engineers get together. This started in the early 2000s, and every two years, these meetings have been held uh, around the world. Uh, the last one was in Maryland. Uh, the one before that was in Tokyo. I think the one before that was in Italy. The one before that, uh, I don't think there's been one of these planetary defense conference meetings in Canada, but um, there's really an international uh, approach involving Europe is a major contributor. Russia has been. Uh, I, I'm not sure that they're continuing the level of effort that they were before. Um, Japan, China, um, there is in, indeed interest in elements of this in, in Canada. I, I mentioned the main maintenance of the uh, terrestrial impact crater database at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton. And uh, there are astronomers and planetary scientists. Um, at the uh, University of Western Ontario, there's a group of people that are very interested and probably the world's experts in bright meteors. Um, when uh, someone see, see anywhere around the world sees a, a really bright meteor, uh, including Chelyabinsk, but there are lesser events uh, every few months. Peter Brown at the University of Western Ontario is the people is the person who is called, um, and there are some South American astronomers who are interested. There's. Uh, it's it's, it's a it, it's worldwide interest, and of course the United States and NASA. Um, this has more resources really than any place else except possibly Europe. Um, but uh, I, I've shown you the uh, spacecraft missions from from Japan and I, I believe that China and India are interested in asteroids as well. So it's a, it's a worldwide uh, scientific effort. It's been take, taken quite a while to really raise adequate funds from NASA and the European Space Agency and JAXA and so on. Uh, but within the last uh, decade, um, I think there's been uh, really uh, perhaps adequate support for space missions and telescopes and, and uh, computer, computer facilities that can uh, attempt to deal with the problem. Thank you very much. Um, another question on the line. Uh, what are some of the most important research questions that you believe should be addressed to improve management of the risk of loss and damage resulting from asteroid impacts? Reduce the risk. Well, I, I mentioned a variety during my talk, and I'm not sure which is the most important. I, uh, I, I think that Many of the people listening to this uh, webinar uh, might consider working on the on efforts to understand the human psychology, the econ potential economics of uh, uh, of an impact. Uh, at the Tokyo Planetary Defense Conference, uh, it was you know there were there were very few people who were who were there who really were knowledgeable about. Uh, international politics, about economics, and and so on. And but one guy who's actually an astronaut uh, suggested when he saw the risk corridor uh, for a uh, tabletop exercise uh, threatened Tokyo. Um, he thought just the idea that there was a one in a hundred chance of Tokyo being struck by an asteroid might cause mass panic and evacuation of. Tokyo and values of uh, properties would go way down and so on. And, and, and we had no expertise really there at that conference to evaluate that. And maybe people um, in, in, in your line of work uh, could endeavor to, I mean, you, you have a better knowledge about how, uh, about the calculation of, of risks and how to reduce them for other kinds of uh, disasters and what, what the politics and economics 
are. And I, I think that would be a very fruitful area because it certainly is not one that spacecraft engineers and, and astronomers know anything about. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have one last question uh, from our online audience, and I would like to invite anyone else uh, online. If you have any other questions, please uh, type them up right now so I can make sure to uh, ask them. Um, so the question is, do, do you believe that the risk of asteroid impacts is getting appropriate attention from decision makers uh, in comparison to other hazards? Well, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I, you know, I, I think about the fact that, you know, certainly money spent to reduce drunk driving, to, uh, to, to significantly decrease uh, death rate from common disease and so on, uh, you'd think is money well spent. But then my mother, uh, way back when I was a kid, um, was found to have a very extremely unusual growth in her eye, um, actually, a, I guess, a tumor that n no one in the United States knew what to do with. And uh, so our family moved to London where an experimental radiation treatment was, was given to her. And, uh, and it it killed off the, the tumor, sort of damaged the eye, but she lived to be, uh, she only died a few years ago at the age of 101 and a half. So I'm in, in favor of addressing low probability risks as, 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 as well as uh, common ones, I think. But what the weighting should be, I don't know. There are, of course, people in my general field who would love to have more funding for what the, what they do, but that's true of anyone doing anything in the world. Um, I, I guess I used to think that there was inadequate funding back in the 1990s, but I think that's been uh, rectified. I think that the general level addressing these questions, uh, general level of funding is, is, is reasonable. Okay, thank you. Uh, so another question that came up. Um, so one of the measures we can use uh, to evaluate asteroid impacts is found uh, by looking at the impact craters. Another measure would be through assessment of historic large tsunamis. Uh, has there been research to assess uh, or perhaps reconcile different approaches to identify past uh, large impacts of asteroids? Yeah, there is uh, there is a community, a scientific community of people interested in uh, terrestrial impact craters, and uh, you know they're geologists, and uh, um, you know they use various techniques. Uh, for example, the Chicxulub crater in the Yucatan part of Mexico that is the site of the uh, Cretaceous. Paleogene uh, impact 66 million years ago, there have been major drilling projects to drill down into that crater to understand it. Um, field geology uh, is, you know, people have been and examined the craters in Canada and Australia and, and elsewhere in considerable detail, but of course, uh, instruments and techniques uh, gradually improve over the years. Um, uh, that, that provides insight into uh, understanding what might happen when you crash into an asteroid or what might happen if an asteroid crashes into us. Uh, sure. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I would like to thank you for a, a really great presentation that was uh, certainly perfect. Uh, for this audience uh, on my behalf, on behalf of Paul and all the ICLR team. Um, I would also like to invite you to, uh, if you have any last thoughts, to, to share it now. Well, I, I just put up a slide here which has some links to uh, useful things available on the web that you might want, want to look at. Um, they, they're, they're just a few. Uh, there's, there's, these happen to be oriented toward uh, things published in the United States, but uh, they're, they're pretty detailed. And uh, one of these is a major report done just two years ago, the one at the bottom, the NASA so-called SDT 
report. SDT stands for Science Definition Team, and it doesn't say anything about asteroids, but it's all about the asteroid impact hazard. Um, the, for up-to-date news about what's happening, like if, if you read in the, you know, in the local paper or in the TV news uh, about an asteroid about to fly by the Earth, uh, go to this JPL website. Um, they, they keep pretty much up to date on the reality of, uh, of these kinds of reports that appear in the press. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm glad uh, people were interested in the talk and uh, um, let me go back to my, uh, I, I, ha I have my, my uh, email address there and glad to hear from people individually. Um, or you can Google me and I have a sort of out of date website of my own but it has lots of uh, lots of uh, things that might lead you elsewhere uh, uh, of interest but anyway glad to do it and uh, uh, I hope that uh, things keep going well in Canada and that there aren't any more craters uh, formed in the near future uh -huh. we certainly hope so uh, thank you so much once again Clark uh, and thanks for everyone who joined us today. Uh, this was our last uh, Friday Forum for 2019. Uh, I would just like to remind you that we do have one scheduled for January 24th uh, by Michael Collage on uh, new information that was made available on uh, earthquake risk and risk of damage in Canada from an earthquake. Uh, so please join us on January 24th for that. And also please join me in thanking again uh, Clark for this uh, really wonderful presentation. Well, thank you very much.